Bon, bienvenue au CCA euh, sur ce nuit euh, un peu euh, une tempête qui est dehors. Welcome to the CCA. My name is Shannon Harvey. Um, I'm the exhibition coordinator here at the CCA. We're very pleased to have Kenneth Goldsmith joining us from New York City on the occasion of this uh, curator's talk for the current exhibition called Intermission, Films from a Heroic Future, Entracte, Film d'un futur héroïque. Cette expo utilise des films pour faire le lien entre les thèmes de l'expo précédente, qui s'appelait La vitesse et les limites, et de celle qui va suivre, qui s'appelle Autre Odyssée d'espace, Michael Maltzen, Greg Lynn et Alessandro Poli. For this show, curators from four archives, Ubu Web, the National Air and Space Museum, the NFB, and NASA, selected films that explore the themes of speed and space. They're presented in continuous loops in this room. Uh, there's con a continuous loop in the NASA room. And they're also all of these films are also available for viewing on individual viewing stations in Gallery 7. Avec les soirées de jeudi, on a offert une opportunité pour explorer les archives en plus de profondeur et de raconter et uh, entendre une histoire des commissaires. In December, we had Albert O'Hayan and Mark St. Pierre join us from the NFB. Two weeks ago, we had Dr. Jeremy Kinney from the National Air and Space Museum in Washington. And tonight, we're very pleased to have Kenneth. Last week, we presented a selection by Kenneth uh, on the topic of motion studies. And tonight, um, Kenneth is going to especially speak about Ubu Web Archive itself, as well as present Happy Birthday to John, which is a 24 minute, minute film by Jonas Mekas. He's going to explain more about UbuWeb, so I won't go into too much detail, but it's an online uh, archive, and he's the founder of this archive. Um, he's also the author of 10 books of poetry and the editor of I'll Be Your Mirror, the selected Andy Warhol interviews, which was the basis for an opera called Trans Warhol that premiered in Geneva in March of 2007. Kenneth is the host of a weekly radio show on New York City's WFMU, and he teaches writing at the University of Pennsylvania, where he's a senior editor of Penn Sound, an online poetry archive. He's been awarded the Anschutz Distinguished Fellowship in American Studies at Princeton University in 2009-2010, and received the Quartz Electronic Music Award in Paris in 2009. UbuWeb is a really interesting archive because of the incredible breadth of its content, its web-based nature, and its role in the distribution of information. Uh, we were really happy to have the opportunity to collaborate on this project, um, and we're excited to hear more about the origins and the development of this online project itself. As a final note, I have to let you know that this presentation will be recorded um, and possibly used for educational purposes or, and or on the CCA website and podcast. Um, je, comme note finale, je dois vous advertir que la présentation ce soir va être enregistrée et peut-être utilisée pour des... Um, uh, de, de, uh, so, without further ado, I think we're going to uh, start with the film. Do you want to provide a bit of an intro? Well, it, you know, in a way, it's, uh, this is just as good as, as any of the uh, Lennon-Ono films that we have on the side, because Jonas Meek has just always had a way of being in the right place at the right time. And so in this film, you'll see shots of Warhol, you'll see shots of Allen Ginsberg, you'll see, I mean, wherever the action was, Meekus was filming, uh, with his with his camera, Ringo Starr. There's all, I mean, everybody's in this film, and it's 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 a, a documentation that was done for Lenin's 30th birthday, on the occasion of the Yoko Ono retrospective at the Everson Museum in Syracuse, New York, in 1971. So we'll just um, play this one. Uh, I, I also want to say that this is an AVI file. It's, it's a very important. It's lousy resolution. I made them about four years ago when uh, I first started hearing and uh, about this so-called underground films, you know. Uh, people like Bruce Connor was sending us films over that they'd use our Beatle music for the background, mm -hmm. things like that. And well, we'd been messing around with eight mil films for a long time, you know, but not, not making like silly films, you know, like comedies, trying to make funny films on eight mil, like home movies. But then after the sort of psychedelic underground age, 
I just started filming everything on slow motion and just superimposing things on it all the time. Yeah. So it's all like self-edited, you know, each, each four-minute film is a film itself. Some of them I stuck together, and one time I uh, edited a few together, but it was such a bore, and it, did, it wasn't most as good. It's coming more, it's becoming more and more yeah. editing during the shooting. Okay. Yeah, right, right, so yeah, I did, you do it after I'd shot it, a few so and edited them while I was shooting them, yeah. you know, I, I thought, well, let's have a go with an eight, eight, let's try and edit it and see if I, I can do something, but it was always better just to shoot it and make that the editing, you know. Because otherwise one goes to a completely different process. Anyway, there's always yeah. things like just filming water, you know, like the swimming pool water, and then winding it back and then filming something else on it, so as it had all this... Superimposition? Superimposition all the time, you know. <laughs> but once they went into Super 8, I, it took me about a year to learn how to handle the 8mm Canon camera, and then every, all the cameras were changing. I could never learn again to do another one, so I, I stopped doing it.
Um, that uh, party that they were at uh, was in Great Neck on Long Island at an art collector's house. It was just great. I mean, to see there's Jerry Rubin there, I mean, you know, getting high with John Lennon. Uh, just a <clears throat> very uh, beautiful document by Jonas Mikas. And then, of course, the end, if you weren't aware, was the Lennon Memorial right after his, the day after his uh, slaying uh, in Central Park. Okay. So um, this is UbuWeb, ubu.com. Um, I founded the site in 1996 um, as a site for mostly visual and concrete poetry. And over the years, it evolved into um, being a center for the avant-garde and distribution of the avant-garde. We were not able to show the films that we were supposed to show here, which were uh, a bunch of uh, Yoko Ono's films and a bunch of John Lennon's films. Now, they've been up on Ubu for, I don't know, forever, right? Nobody ever bothered us about them. But when the CCA wanted to show the films, they had to approach the estate of uh, Lennon and Ono, or a, a corporation, I mean, you know, maybe the estate of Michael Jackson, I don't know, and say, uh, you know, we'd like, to, we'd like to show these films. Uh, and we're doing this collaboration with, with Ubu, and they're up on Ubu, and they went, what? They're up on Ubu? And uh, they said, you tell them to take them down right away, or there'll be a legal suit. And um, so it's, it's such a strange thing that happens, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm really flattered to be here. I really am. Um, but when I got this email from Shannon um, back in the summer, and she said, we want to do a show at the CCA of films from the NFB, from NASA, from the Smithsonian, and from UbuWeb. I was like, what, you know, what doesn't belong here? You know, and I, 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 I mean, I, I thought it was, I mean, really amazing, really amazing um, that, and this is happening more and more because, you know, people think this is for real, you know, the site. They, they think it's you know, official in some way. And it, everything I'm gonna say is a complete contradiction because it is real and it is become an institution, but not in any way that we recognize um, institutions anymore being. You see, so it's very complicated. I mean, I'm very flattered and Ubu is uh, the woman who's curating the next Documenta, Documenta 13, drops a line to Ubu, says, we must meet, we want the spirit of Documenta 13, which is in you know, two years, three years or something, we want it to be um, inspired by the spirit of UbuWeb, right? You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of silly. I mean, it's, it's a hobby. I call this, you know, it's like knitting. You know, it's kind of a, 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 thing, a thing that I do. So it's, it's become this kind of strange thing that it never really intended to be. So, we had this really, it's been really a lot of work putting this thing together. Because when NASA, you know, wanted to show films, they owned the films and they showed them. We don't own anything on Ubu. We just simply post things. And so I said to Shannon, originally I said, hey, wouldn't it be great, why don't you guys do this? If you really want to work in the spirit of Ubu, why don't you download a bunch of AVIs from Ubu and throw them into a VLC projector, and just like we just did, and let them let them run, let's not tell anybody. That would be the, <laughs> the spirit of, of Ubu. And she said to me, she said, that sounds great. I really like it, you know, because she just came out of art school and she used Ubu as a resource and it was Shannon's idea that, that Ubu become a part of this thing. And she said, I, I'll get back to you the, after the weekend. <laughs> and I got a phone call um, next week saying, you know, we can't do that. We actually have to go and we actually have to get permissions for all the films that we're going to show um, on, on the, uh, at the CCA. So this is the film and video section. As you can see, it's massive. Um, and some of these are permission, but, you know, most of them aren't. Um, you know, we didn't get James Joyce's permission or, or <laughs> Salvador Dali doesn't, doesn't know he's there, but Merce Cunningham does. And when Ubu was reviewed in the New York Times, they, they love, you know, for the, for the rub, for the story, they want, they want to say, so how do you feel having your work on a site that's not permission? And Merce Cunningham said the sweetest thing. He said, the intellectual value of having my words and my actions out there far outweighs any monetary remuner remuneration that I will ever get from 
um, from it. I think he says, I think it's terrific. And that's usually the attitude. But an institution like the CCA couldn't, they just couldn't do it. So we started this volley of emails back and forth for months and months and months. I would suggest something, and she'd say, oh no, we couldn't get the rights to that. Will you please suggest another one? Um, then I had an, a meeting with um, Electronic Arts Intermix, which is a big film and video distributor in New York. Um, you know, they sell, they do the traditional kind of distribution, the sort of uh, renting of things. And they were like, we need to have a meeting with you because much, much of what he is here is on, on EAI. I just looking, you know, Tony Ausler, Nam June Pike, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of the kind of art world stuff is EAI stuff. And we had a meeting and in the meeting it came up that one of the artists that um, we showed here at the CCA actually had to actually receive money and received a rental as a result of being on Ubu, which I said. So you see, it begins to work the other way as well, because if you're doing a, a museum situation, you can't show an AVI, and you really can't show streaming flash. I mean, you can, but you can't. So that things like the electronic arts distributors or the video database um, can keep their market going, but this is for use, okay? Now, Ubu has discovered it's all possible because we've discovered a really weird thing that nobody else has discovered here. And the, what we've discovered is that everything that we have up on Ubu is of no monetary value. It's absolutely worthless monetarily, really. There's nothing here that anybody ever made any money on whatsoever, okay? And as a result, it's kind of like people don't really care. People are happy to have that work out and happy to have the work shown, have, happy to have, have the exposure. And um, it's permitted us to sort of be, uh, you know, to be illegal, because what we're doing is clearly illegal. What, what, this is clearly wrong by the, by the, you know, a court of law would just completely, I, I'm guilty. And yet, for 15 years, it keeps working, and it keeps working, and it keeps working. So, you know, you, I believe in legitimate economies. I mean, I really do. If you have something to sell, and you can really sell it, and there's something, there's, you know, there's a way that you can make money, I think you sh you know, I have no problem with Madonna's sense of economy. It's just not the same sense of economy as, uh, you know, Dennis Oppenheim. Or, or, or the uh, Atelier National uh, de Manitoba. This is a great piece. <laughs> and <laughs> that, this, this, I don't know if you've seen this. I'm sure you've seen it. It's very famous. And they were so thrilled when they you know, found it. But here's also kind of what, what begins happening on Ubu was if you Google Ubu Web, you can't find it, right? I removed it from, from Google. So, you can get links to it, you can get a Wikipedia page to it, but if you put in like the name John Lennon plus Ubu Web, unless somebody's linking to it, it will not show up, okay? Now they write books on how to get your Google ranking up, and I'm, we're going the opposite way. We're like, how to get off this thing. But the thing is, you know, because, oh, well, let me just tell you, we're on all the bad search engines, you know, like Ask Jeeves, you can find Ubu Web, or <laughs> Alta Vista. <laughs> We're like number one on Alta Vista. <laughs> Bing, you can find us on Bing. And the reason was is that what happens to most of this stuff, which is just really weirdo ephemera stuff, is that it often falls into the hands of some bizarre relative, like an estate of, of a really important artist that made weird sounds or made just strange films or p scribbles on postcards or something that never translated. You know, after the person dies, it goes to like their, you know, niece in Detroit. And their niece in Detroit now feels like they've inherited something that's extremely valuable, okay? And so what they do is they set Google alerts for the name of the, uh, of the, of the artist. And when it comes up, they immediately write a letter saying, you know, you must pay us for this or, you know, give us a cease and desist. And what I do is I always write back to people that, that, talk, that talk about this. I always write back and I always say, you know, 
it's in the better interest of this very obscure artist to have their work up on Ubu, even if we didn't ask permission. They say, but why didn't you ask permission? Because if we had to ask permission, this whole thing wouldn't exist the way it does. There's 5,000 artists on this thing. I mean, that was the film and video portion. The sound, the sound portion is even, is even crazier. And it's much larger than, than the film. And I would go back and forth, and I'd say, look, you know, it's in their best, it's, it's, it's really in the best interest for, for you to have this there. Da, da, da. And they often agree, and like Charlotte Mormon's archive, the entire thing came to Ubu, because we went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth with these states. So it's fine. But this takes just a ton of money and a ton of time. And quite frankly, it's me and, you know, the stu three students doing this whole thing, you know, my students, whoever, and then they, you know, they leave and they become lawyers, and I got to get new students. So, you know, the idea, the, I can't imagine the amount of emails, paperwork, legal stuff that you guys had to do in order to clear. I, no, I do know because I did the Warhol book, and that was a legitimate thing. I got paid in advance. It was a legitimate economy, and my entire advance went to paying people for their interviews, clearing rights, clearing photographic rights. I mean, I had to do it, you know, that was, that was the thing. But it costs a lot of money. So in other words, if we didn't, if we asked for permission, this thing wouldn't, would not exist whatsoever, okay? Um, so I'm gonna quickly just kind of run through a few things on the site. I don't wanna keep you too long. Um, you can feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. I can I'll show you a couple of weird corners of Ubu that you probably don't know about. Um, I just wanted to say that, that, that the site began um, as a site for visual and concrete poetry. And, you know, the, I mean, real classic stuff like, like, like this. Um, I found these, I was really loving concrete poetry in the, in the early 90s, and I couldn't find any of it. So I started scanning books, and they looked so beautiful backlit on the screen as if they were really meant to be that way. And this is like, this, is, this was put up in 96. Um, you know, these very, very simple language things. Um, this is Eugen Graminger from, from uh, Switzerland, who's still alive. And then what began to happen as we moved on was we began to, um, we used real audio at first. And that was really a, a, a terrible thing. And, and it was, it was pr proprietary and it was closed source and they stopped supporting Macs and it was, it was a disaster. So everything then began to move to uh, MP3s and then of course, uh, you know, you can, you, uh, can listen to everything here. So you can actually follow along with the score. You can listen to it. All the red links are downloadable. This, this, these things here are little delicious streaming links. Um, so yeah, then so so bandwidth began to began to increase, and as it began to increase, we began to put um, all sorts of you know this strange Salvador Dali film, which has never been shown before, Richard Serra's Boomerang. Uh, Beckett's film, which is really a beautiful thing. This is, uh, Grove, Grove Press did this, and it was extremely uh, hard to find before the internet. And it's a silent film by Beckett from 65 that he did with Buster Keaton. It's just a, an absolutely beautiful thing. And by the way, I wanna let you know, if you don't know, because I have to keep it kind of quiet, that right under, under, under the uh, film is a, is a red link, and under the red link is always a downloadable high-res version. But I have to keep that quiet, because you know, filmmakers were so upset originally because they, you know, oh, they're giving away our films. Um, so what I did was I put up a big post on Ubu, and I said, oh, Ubu's going all streaming, like we're like YouTube now, so don't worry, you can't get it, but I always keep a little quiet thing and there, so you can always take it, because the idea of ubiquitous you know, connectivity, the, the data cloud is, is a fiction. It's ridiculous. I, I've been without internet now since, you know, from the moment I left, left you know, 
high, high bandwidth since, since I left New York. I mean, it's ridiculous. The cloud doesn't follow you around. But I had things on my laptop that I downloaded and I watched in the airport while I was stuck there. You see, it's ridiculous. So, so the idea that if it can't be downloaded, it, in a sense, it doesn't really exist for many people. You know, and I like the streaming thing. I use the streaming thing. I, you know, the, the resolution is a little crappy, but you know, another thing I want to say is the resolution should be crappy. The minute that this thing gets really good, then it's somebody else's job. I mean, the idea is that this is, these are like, these are like thumbnails, you know. This is like you can't have the experience, but you can have the web. I mean, a lot of people don't, aren't fortunate enough to live in a place like Montreal that does incredible shows like this, and you come out and see some guy talk about a Beckett film. And this doesn't happen in the provinces. It doesn't happen in small towns where people don't have money to come to major metropolitan areas, people that are tied to elderly parents, people that, that are tied to jobs, and, you know, children, all sorts of, sorts of situations. But the irony is that it is becoming the experience, okay? So I say, I say, look, this is the real experience. The real experience is for you to sit in a theater with a group of uh, warm-bodied, like-minded people like we just watched the Lennon film because the cinema is social um, and experience it together. You know, this is wonderful, but most people can't do that. So this is becoming the experience for most people. And in a sense, it, um, Ubu is becoming really unwillingly and unwittingly is becoming a, a history. Like now, if people want to know about the history of the avant-garde and they're not in school or they're not in art schools or they can't afford to very fancy educations, they can learn all about the history of the avant-garde on Ubu. But that's really problematic because it wasn't set out to become that. It was kind of like a hobby of a guy that, you know, who, you know I was a record collector. So I used to go to you know, flea markets and collect records, and I had book, you know, my apartment's just you know, jammed with these things, and now the internet was a way to show that. So it's terrible. I mean, it's, it's, an, absolute, it's an absolute disaster. I mean, the taxonomy of the site is, is an embarrassment. You know, uh, you know, contemporary, what does that mean? Historical, you know, it's terrible. Art historians cringe, but there's nothing else. You see, what we have on Ubu dwarfs the holdings of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. The Museum of Modern Art, their website is a brochure. People don't want a brochure. This is what they don't understand, is that people want content. They really do. They want experience. And, and uh, you can't show paintings on the internet. It doesn't work. You have to go to the painting to experience it. Otherwise, it's, a, it's like a photograph of a painting. But for music, as we all know with MP3s and as we're becoming accustomed to with video, these types of other formats are becoming satisfactory. So um, anyway, I got to tell you a great story. Um, I got this email from this guy. And he goes, um, check out my URL. This is many years ago. U-N-D-E-R-S-T-A-N-D-I-N-G-D-U-C-H-A-M-P dot com right, understandingduchamp.com. And so I look on, you know, somebody sends me something, I like to look at things people send me, right? So it's a little flash site of, of, of Duchamp, and you know, you can see this, and you go, oh, that's nice, you know, isn't that? That's good, you know, that's okay, you know. Okay, so I wrote him back, I said, you know, like I usually do, thank you for sharing that with me. He says, well, actually the reason I was writing you, it, it, he said, if you like that, you're gonna love this. And I said, well, okay. So I click on this, and he shows me this thing called Aspen Magazine. And I said, I, I really hadn't heard of it. And what this was, was, as you can see, from 65 to 71, each issue came in a box filled with books. These come in the, remember typewriter paper? Those boxes? And so it came with films. And you would get, you would get flexi discs, and you get, you know, you get a little eight millimeter, eight, super eight film, and you get, get you know, all sorts of little ephemera in a box. And I was like, wow, well, that, that looks pretty cool. Until I began to look at who was a part of this thing. And as I began to scroll down through it, it was like everyone from Roland Boris to J.G. Ballard to uh, William Burroughs and John Cage and John Cale. And as you can see, it's, I mean, it's absolutely uh, out of control, William de Kooning. So I said to him, I said, this is amazing. Why?" Is it behind a lock and key, a password? And he said to me, 
he said to me, because the heirs of the estate of Marcel Duchamp sued him for creating that site, Understanding Duchamp. They wanted money because evidently they own the copyright to the name Duchamp. And he settled with them out of court for like 2,000 bucks. He said, this is ridiculous. There's hundreds of artists here, hundreds. I mean, look at every, uh, they're all lawsuits waiting to happen. And he got, you know, he got completely scared. I said, look, I don't care. You know, look, I'll, I'll, I, I, this is what I do all the time. Let me, let me take it, let me deal with it. And as a result, we've just gotten this absolutely incredible trove of stuff from the 60s, which is just so great. And I just quickly, quickly show you some, some of the things here. These are, this is a pop art issue that was done by Warhol. And so you have uh, an early essay about rock and roll by Lou Reed. And the guy, you know, he did all the work, he did all the HTML, it's just so, so beautiful, I think. It's a really beautiful translation of the web. You have um, these flexidisks. Do you remember what flexidisks were? They used to come like, you know, um, on the back of cereal boxes? But you'd have flexidisks of, Mel of Morton Feldman and, 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 and the Velvet Underground. So this is a flexidisk of, of John Cale and the, and the Velvet Underground. He's called Loop. And it says on the original disc of this uh, lock room. It's, I mean, it's, it's just, it's so incredible to me, um, uh, this whole thing. There's paintings, you get little postcards of, of a, of a, from a prominent collector. And this is great too. You have, you know, flip books. Do you remember? Flip books, uh, they were like, the, you know, the th do you know what I'm ta talking about, those things? Okay, those things. So, so here's a little flip book that he translated for, for uh, Jack Smith. And you know, a little flip book of a fan, you know? It's sweet. And he, he made a little animation of it. Um, this is a flip book by Andy Warhol called Kiss. And in typical Warhol fashion, every page is the same. So. <laughs> No, so no, nothing ever happens, <laughs> which I just thought was really, you know, was really funny and really clever. These things go for an absolute ton of money right now. Um, and, the, you know, you had the Velvet Underground's newspaper, the Exploding Plastic Inevitable, and all sorts of stuff. And I'll just show you one or two more. The British issue is really incredible. It's a little portrait of swinging London done by Mario Amaya from the summer of 1970, which is which is a, just a year after he was shot when he was in, in Warhol's loft. Mario Maya was the other guy that got shot during the Warhol shooting. And he was a British, uh, a British curator who happened to be in the wrong place uh, at, the, at, the, at the wrong time. Um, but there's some great things. And here I want to talk about the Lennon diary. Let's go back to John Lennon for a minute um, um, from 1969. And it's this hysterical diary that just goes on and on and on and he, it's, it's the same thing. It just says, got up, went to work, came home, watched, che watched telly, went to sleep. Got up, went to work, came home, fucked wife, went to bed. You know, and it goes on for the entire, <laughs> there, now we're in April and May. <laughs> I mean, it's really, really very beautiful. It's such a great piece. And, 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 uh, also in there were these recordings, again, since we're, we're talking about Lennon and Ono. Um, and these are things that ended up, of the Ono stuff, very beautiful, that ended up getting, getting released. Leaves falling everywhere Snow is falling all the time Between a milk bottle and a beer can so they're, they're, they're really gorgeous, quiet songs that, that did finally found their way to CD. But this, John Lennon's radio play, <laughs> for eight minutes of him fiddling around with uh, the dial of a radio, and I think I'll just open it in a separate window, so you fast forward, never sort of went anywhere. Now everybody thinks it was, it was, it was uh, Lennon that, that did Revolution Number no. 9, all the avant-garde stuff and all the Stockhausen, but in fact, that really was Paul McCartney. But when he was hanging out with, junked out with Yoko, playing with the knob, somebody turned on the recording and made, you know, he tolerated her, her stuff. Um, whereas McCartney was, was actually the guy that really loved this stuff.
And of course, he's listening to Stockhausen's shortwave radio pieces from the time as well. But the thing is, you know, the thing is, and I think this is a great example of, we never heard from the estate of John Lennon. You have, you know, arguably you have the most lucrative money-making generating machine in the history of rock and roll up on your site, the most legitimate economy ever, but they never bothered us about him twiddling around with a radio. So, you know, again, this is, I think, a very good example of how the site actually functions. Um, so, uh, just a few more things and then, then you know, Another thing that, that happened, which was just wonderful for Ubu, um, we did this, this, this uh, uh, section of outsider art, and you know, things, weird things that, that people, people find on the streets. <laughs> and you know, the question is, what, well, what, what, what does this have to do with anything? But in fact, um, in fact a lot of, there's a lot of crossover with, um, with, the, with kind of concrete poetry, graphism, and... Um, you know the way that the the way that words the way that words look on the page. This is really where we began. <laughs> you know, this is really where we began. I began like thinking that. You know, I began having trouble like like distinguishing like what then is avant-garde and what is um, outsider, um, and this was then confirmed to me when we received a huge archive called the 365 Days Project on Ubu. And these are, of course, um, 365 days, one MP3 per day of weird people. Uh, you have celebrity, children, demonstration music, indigenous outsider, song poems, spoken ventriloquism, and so on, as they say. And I mean, they're, they're just, when this thing came out, it was like a great meme, an enormous meme out in the world. Um, and when I was looking through that, I came across something from the composer Nicholas Slonimsky, who was in the 365 Days Project, which is an outsider art thing. Now, Nicholas Slonimsky was the most notorious ultra-modernist conductor in New York around 1913. He would only play things that were absolutely, you know, ear-shatteringly dissonant. He did Ives, he did Ruggles, he did Varese. And yet here he is, somehow, on the kind of strange outsider stuff. So I thought, wow, well, what's this all about? And it's him singing. Okay, we're all right. Even a fret for billions. For Castoria, mother, relieve your constipated child. Hurry, mother, even a fret for billions. Feverish child loves the pleasant taste of Castoria. You know, what he's doing is he's setting, <laughs> he's setting, he's setting advertisements from the turn of the century to music, and that would, you know, constipation relief. So I thought that was really interesting, you know, because on Ubu, we have Slonimsky's ultra-modernism. This is a very rare thing, and it's, you know, a little Edgar Varese. This is, this is, this is what he's mostly known for. get the idea. He was so hardcore that he was banned from conducting ever in New York. I mean, he was just too, too extreme, and he went on to become a really great um, uh, musical historian. He wrote the Baker's Dictionary, uh, which is to this day one of the most comprehensive, uh, wonderful uh, books on music. So it, this is the point. The point is that suddenly it's like the genres are collapsing. You know, you don't know. Well, Slaninsky is is, is a nutty outsider, and he's also a nutty outsider in the ultra-modernist sense, but he's also one of the most important modernist and high art composers. And what this says to me, really, is that tastes today aren't 
all one way. And I, I don't think they've ever been. And I think we got to find that out when we began to do, say, Napster and file sharing. And you'd browse another person's files, and because you'd, you'd look, say, you'd look for John Cage, and you'd go and you'd browse another person's files. And you'd go, oh wow, this is a guy that loves John Cage. I'm sure he's got, you know, got, uh, you know, Nicholas Leninsky and Varez recordings too that I can download. But snuggled up to the CA, in the John Cage was also albums by Mariah Carey, CA. R and CAG, and so suddenly, for the first time ever, Mariah Carey and John Cage are sitting next to each other. And okay, so I'm I'm sort of done. Uh, I could talk much longer. I just want to just quickly say um, that your country is hosting all of the uh, media files. Uh, uh, York University is extremely progressive, and they have decided to take on UbuWeb as a field of study in radical distribution. And part of that, they said you can have unlimited server space and, 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 and uh, bandwidth, because you know, I mean if you get a, if you're a meme, if you're, if you're a meme on, on Slashdot or Metafilter, you'll get a, a $2,500 bill for the day, a bandwidth bill usage. So you can imagine we're pulling five gigabytes a second of bandwidth on UberWeb, and the bill for that would be absolutely insane. So what they've done, they said, we will host everything, and we will give you unlimited bandwidth if you will consent to be an object of our study. And that's, I <laughs> said sure. You know, so I just want to finish by saying that it doesn't cost me anything to run this thing. It costs me 50 bucks a month to keep the domain name Ubu. Oh, I have to tell you, isn't that a great domain name? A three-letter symmetrical UBU. This is a very valuable thing for those of you that are in the internet industry. This is an extremely valuable thing. Um, the way I got that, it used to be ubuweb.com, which is, you know, why. But a friend of mine was dating a guy that squatted on domain names early on, a guy from a <laughs> website called Suck. Uh, I don't know, maybe some of you remember suck.com in, in the, in the mid-90s. And she was dating, she said, you have ubu.com, you've got to give that to Kenny. And he, so he said, oh, yeah, you know, whatever, sure. And he said, I'll give it to you on, 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 on the, for the one, for, for no money, with the express... Uh, one rule is that you never sell it and that you always use it for art and poetry. Now, this is not just a three-letter, you know, domain. This is not QRQ. This is UBU. So I've got these companies forever trying to buy the domain name product because our product lets UBU. <laughs> Please sell it to us. And they've offered, you know, they offer, they, they, they've Sometimes they'll offer a lot of money. And it's just such a great thing to be able to just say to them, fuck you, this space is for poetry, you know? <laughs> so.